Hi everyone. I'd like to take a few minutes today and talk about graphing motion. Our objectives, we're going to talk about how we construct and interpret graphs and diagrams for position, velocity, and acceleration. And then we'll see how we can use the slopes and the areas of these graphs to make some calculations, some interpretations of what's going on. So we'll start off by talking about particle diagrams. And these are sometimes known as dot diagrams or ticker tape diagrams. And you can think about these as if you have uh, an oil leak in your car and you drip a drop of oil at a specific interval, the same interval every time. If you looked as your car was moving at what had happened on the pavement later on, looked at that oil drop pattern, you could tell a lot about what your car was doing. That's the point of these diagrams. For example, if your car is moving here to the right and it's giving off that steady oil leak, and when you go and examine these oil drops, you see that they are always the same distance apart, it should be pretty easy to see that this is probably occurring because your car was moving at a constant velocity. Now what you can't tell from just the oil drops is whether your car was moving to the right or to the left. Have to see the car to do that. But you can tell it was moving at a constant velocity. If instead your car was accelerating to the right, when you were first starting out at low velocity, the oil drops would be closer together. And over time, they get further and further apart as you are going faster and faster, have a higher and higher velocity. Your particle diagram now is non-uniform. So that particle diagram, the ticker tape or dot diagram, shows you a car that's accelerating to the right. Or, however, it could be that your car was moving to the left and it was slowing down. Your velocity was to the left and your acceleration was pointing to the right. Your velocity and acceleration are in different directions than your speed decreases. Can you think of a case in which the car could have a negative velocity, a negative acceleration, and be speeding up? Well, if you have a car and it's moving to the left, it has a negative velocity. And if it's also accelerating to the left, the acceleration and the velocity vectors are in the same direction. It would actually speed up. Let's take a look now at position time graphs. Let's assume that we have a dog that starts on their back porch. We'll call that position zero. And over time, the dog wanders away from the house at a constant one meter per second for five seconds. So after one meter, one second, the dog will have gone one meter. After two seconds, the dog will have gone two meters and so forth. So we get a position time graph that looks like this for the first five seconds. Now, the dog decides she's tired. She's going to take a rest for five seconds. So she lays down, takes a little nap, and over those five seconds, position doesn't change. It remains constant because the dog isn't moving. The velocity of the dog is zero. Now the dinner bell rings, the dog gets excited and comes flying back to the house. So in two and a half seconds now, the dog is now moving at two meters per second. So every one second it covers two meters of distance until it gets back to its starting point. So the position time graph shows you an object's position is a function of time. But we can learn a lot more from it. If we take a look at the same graph, if we take the slope of this first section of the graph, well, the slope is rise over run. And in that interval, that first five seconds, we have a rise of five meters. And it takes five seconds to do that. That gives us a slope of one meter per second. Hey, that's our velocity. So the slope of the position time graph gives you velocity. Between 5 and 10 seconds, during this red interval of the graph, the slope is 0. The slope of a horizontal line is 0. Therefore, the dog's velocity is 0. And that makes sense. That part of the graph occurred when the dog was laying down taking a rest. Finally, for the ending point of the graph, as the dog comes screaming back to the house, if we take the slope there, that's rise over run again. But our rise, well, we actually go have a negative slope. So we have a rise of negative 5 meters. And this all happens in 2.5 seconds from 10 to 12.5 seconds. 
or a slope of negative 2 meters per second, which is exactly equal to the dog's velocity. The dog was going 2 meters per second, but in the negative direction, back from whence it came. Now, if we look at velocity time graphs, they obviously show an object's velocity as a function of time, and we can use the position time graph to help us get that. For example, with the exact same motion of our dog, let's go back and let's take a look over the first five seconds. We said the slope was one meter per second, the dog's velocity. So over the first five seconds on our VT, or velocity time graph, we have a value of one. Then, over the next five seconds, our dog was still at rest. Zero velocity, zero slope. So over the next five seconds, zero velocity. And finally, at the end of our graph, we had a negative slope, a slope of negative 2.5 meters per second. So you can obtain the velocity time graph from the displacement time graph. Even cooler, once we have that velocity time graph, it makes sense if we got the velocity time graph from our, from our position time graph, we should be able to go the other direction, from velocity time back to position time. And of course, we can. The way we do that is we look at the area under the velocity time graph. So the area under the velocity time graph, and we've got to make very sure that we always measure to the zero point. The area in our first five seconds is this rectangle, the area between our line and that zero. That's a rectangle. Area of a rectangle is length times width. So in that first five seconds, area is length times width. The length of a rectangle is five seconds. The width is one meter per second. So five times one is five, and seconds in the numerator and denominator make a ratio of one or cancel out. Our area there is five meters. Well, after five seconds, our position is five meters. In this yellow interval, our object's position changed by five meters. If we go and we look at the next section of the graph, from five to ten seconds, the area between that line and that line, which is the line itself, the zero line, is zero, so the object's position didn't change. It changed. It must have stayed there. And finally, we have this last two and a half seconds. And if we find the area under the graph, which means this rectangle from our line to our zero line, we have another rectangle here in green. And its area, length times width again, our length is 2.5 seconds from 10 to 12.5. And its width is negative 2 meters per second. Negative 2 times 2.5 is negative 5 meters. So in that last time interval, the position changed by negative 5. We came back to where we started. Now we can also look at the slope of a VT graph, just like we looked at the slope of a position time graph to get velocity. If we take the slope of a velocity time graph, we can get acceleration. What's the acceleration of the car at five seconds for this velocity time curve? Well, I go over here to five seconds, and right at that point, my graph is horizontal. The slope of a horizontal line is zero, so acceleration, which is the slope of our VT graph, is zero. Well, how about the total distance traveled by the car during this six second interval? To do that, I need the area between the zero line and this entire graph. But that's kind of tough to calculate exactly as it stands now, so why don't I break those into easier shapes? I'll make this red triangle on the left, and then we'll do that remaining rectangle on the right. Well, the area of our triangle is one half base times height. The area of our rectangle, this green rectangle here, is length times width. So our total area, when I put all this together, is the area of our triangle plus the area of our rectangle. 
or one half base height for our triangle plus length times width for our rectangle. That's one half. The base of our triangle is four seconds. The height of our triangle is 10 meters per second. And for our rectangle, our length is between four and six, so that's two seconds. And its width is that there, 10 meters per second. So one half times four times 10, that's 20 meters, plus two times 10, that's 20 meters, for a total of 40 meters. The complete area under all of this space is 40 meters, and that's the total distance the car traveled in that amount of time. Now, if you take the slope of the VT graph, you get acceleration. It should make sense that you should be able to go the other way, from acceleration time back to VT, back to velocity time. And the way you do that is if you take the area under the acceleration time graph, it tells you the object's change in velocity. So one way to look at it is if we start here with the position time graph on the left, then velocity time, then acceleration time. Anytime we want to go to the right, if we want to go from position time to velocity time, or velocity time to acceleration time, we take the slope. If we want to go the other way to find from acceleration time to find the change in velocity, we take the area. Or a change in position you can get from the velocity time curve by taking the area. So let's take a look at one last question. It asks, which graph best represents the motion of a block accelerating uniformly down an inclined plane? And the key term there is accelerating uniformly. That means if we look at the acceleration time graph, we must have a constant value. Well, what velocity time graph would give us an AT graph like that? Well, if we look at velocity time, the only thing that'll give us a constant value is a straight line. And since this is a positive value for acceleration time, our velocity time graph must have a positive slope. So we know what the velocity time graph looks like. What sort of position time or distance time graph is going to give us this velocity time curve? Well, we need something that starts off with zero slope because our velocity time graph starts at a zero value right there. So we need something that's pretty flat here. And at the high end, way over here, we need a very big slope. So we need something kind of like that. Now we just sort of connect the dots and see that we must end up with this parabolic shape for our distance time or our position time graph. Therefore, the correct answer has to be number four. These take some practice, so what I'd like you to do for some next steps is take 15 seconds or so and walk back and forth in a straight line. You can stop as you're walking, you can accelerate, you can slow down, you can run at a constant velocity, but for 15 seconds, try moving back and forth in a straight line. Then once you're done, see if you can draw the position time graph, the velocity time graph, and the acceleration time graph for that motion. That's good practice. Then, if you have a friend, and I really hope you do have a friend, see if they can do the same thing. Then swap graphs. If you, with your friend's graph, can you recreate their motion? Can you walk the motion that's described on the graphs in front of you? And of course, if you have any questions or need more information, check out aplusphysics.com.